You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 249 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by HandsOnGloves.com. It's the all-in-one revolutionary bathing, grooming gloves. Horsemanship Radio is part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we sit down with a very learned man about horses and building. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, back from sailing, aren't you? I am back. We are back from the Horse Lovers Cruise, which Mm. is something we do every few years at Horse Radio Network, where we invite um, members of our auditors group. If you're not an auditor and you don't know what that means, you need to go to Horse Horse Radio Network and look for the auditors button, which will be on the Horses in the Morning feed. They help support the show and get to do special cool things like going on a trip. It's not educational in any way. It's just fun. And it was <laughs> not, You don't even take your horse, right? Don't take your horse. Don't Although we horse. did all get on the carousel at the same time. Okay. <laughs> kind of counts. Was, re- was really kind of silly. So we did that. So I came back all refreshed and several pounds heavier. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, everything yeah, you floats know, out there, you know? It's okay. Yeah, it's a hazard. So I thought this would be a good episode to chit-chat a little bit about something that popped into my brain a few episodes back when we were talking about groundwork. Mm-hmm. And per, I do a lot of groundwork with Nigel. Good. Something I only discovered recently. That wasn't something that was part of my toolbox early in my horsemanship mm. career. Okay. But I have learned to appreciate both its value for training, but also its value for physical and mental fitness for human and horse. Right. Right. I love that. And what made you think of this? Did you see anybody that was a little unfit on the ground? Or I don't see that many people working from the ground. So I am glad to hear that you do. I Um, do. Um, mm -hmm. And what made me think of that is a few episodes back, I was doing a show with Kayla Benny, who was doing the total EquiHealth episode on Horses in the Morning. If you haven't listened to those, go to Horses in the Morning and look up Total EquiHealth. But we were talking to a gentleman about your physical fitness and your core and how we have a tendency to focus on muscular fitness and we focus Mm -hmm. on cardiovascular fitness, but we don't worry about vestibular fitness, which is Ooh. your balance, the balance mm-hmm. that is controlled by the the gear in your head, your ear to ear. And it's what goes wrong when you have had too many beers and you get pulled over by the police and he wants oh. you to walk down that yellow line and you can't. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't you know. Don't, no, <laughs> nobody here does. That's your vestibular system not working huh. because of okay. alcohol. But if your vestibular system is not exercised regularly, it will not function. Just like if your muscles don't work, get worked, right. your heart doesn't mm-hmm. get worked, if your lungs don't get, get worked, vestibular system doesn't either. Okay. How do you and work it? Work it. And the language of equus, doing groundwork using the language of equus, the language of equus being how you move your body in relation to the horse, mm-hmm. requires improving your vestibular system because if you can't keep your balance moving slowly and quietly and gently with purpose you can't you you can't use the the equus because it's moving in heavy oil right very good this is fascinating i didn't i didn't actually put all that together so somebody who's 88 going on 89 perhaps who has built this into his system for so long actually can keep his balance at an older age. Exactly. Mm, that explains a lot. Yes, that is for someone who is as they're aging, I'm not going to mention any names. Right. Many your vestibular system tends to um, reduce its effectiveness, partly because of age, but mostly because we stop using it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. The, the great part is you don't have to be physically robust to keep your vestibular system, your balance at peak performance, as good as it can possibly be for you personally. You do, there's no, there's no push-ups. 
There's no okay. running. There's no getting your pulse rate up to 55. Think of it as Tai Chi for, for equestrians. Right. Very good. And I, I practice this a lot because I sit, a, sit at a desk for a living now. So, it's, you know, I need to keep after that. Mm-hmm. So I thought, you know, what a great way to improve your skills at every level. Yes, you're going to improve your flexibility and your fitness a little bit because you're moving around in loose footing in an arena, which is different than moving around on a fl- smooth, flat surface. Mm-hmm. You use different muscles and things like that. So mm-hmm. you're going to do that. You're going to improve your balance, which is great for everybody. You're going to improve your situational awareness. What is situational awareness, you say? Mm-hmm. Your ability to take in and process everything that's going on around you, not just the letters you see in front of your face. When you pull into a stop sign, gotcha. you're looking straight ahead, but you also have to look left and right. And if mm-hmm. you have good situational awareness, as you take your foot off the brake and begin to press the gas pedal, you will notice. The car on your right that's just about ready to run the re- run the stop sign opposite mm-hmm. you because you have good situational awareness, mm-hmm. even though you weren't focused over there. Right. Right. So, so if you're, you're prioritizing like, like a flight animal does. But it's also what I love about this is you have to react with your environment, too. So it's not just going and doing, well, Tai Chi, maybe there's a little bit of reacting with your environment, but not like with a horse. Right, right, exactly. So you have to be aware of you have to be aware of the whole horse. You can't just look at his hoof. Is he tracking up? No. Mm -hmm. You have to see the whole horse because his body language is telling you things too, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to shift and and flow with it. And that's why the moving in heavy oil keeps you flowing around a horse, not literally, but it keeps your movements slow and and even um, able to react, but in reacting not in a volatile way, which will throw the horses off, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, you, you, the wild horses that we do in the gentling pens, they are so good at telling us that a flick of a finger was too much. You know, um, any jerk or um, ratchety kind of movement annoys them. And you can see it. I mean, you could literally train your movements with a wild horse you know, in the in the gentling facility, you you know it, Jen. It's it's very safe. We've got a chute system and panels, and yeah, nobody's going to get run over. No. Nobody's going to get run over. Everything, but we we move around them just to desensitize them coming in and out. But if you're not flowy, even if you're too fast going up, too fast going slow, too fast, it, or even um, you know, I see a lot of people make the mistake of. You get a halter just about there and then you like want to pull it, you know, you want to get it done. Yes, yes. You know, and it's just that last little flick right there. Like, oh, but they immediately tell you, right? Yeah, (laughs) They're not going to catch, you're not going to catch that horse off guard. No, I mean, they just, they're so perfect that way. You know, our, our horses in the stalls, you know, they're, they're okay. Yeah. That's her putting that, you know, clumsy like way (laughs) that she does around my blankets and stuff. But, um, but with a wild horse, you can really. Um, it, it's not just about equus. It's just our biofeedback that's happening in our movements. But also, I see a lot of people fear working from the ground with horses, even their old, you know, the horse they've had for 10 years. They're just a lot more comfortable in the saddle, Jen. I just think, you know, there's some sort of fear based. Is he going to jump on me? Especially if you're going to start talking about a windy day or some obstacles you're taking him through or, you know, it's garbage truck day or there's just a lot more anxiety on the ground than in the saddle. Do you see that, too? I see. Well, you know what I see a lot of, at least here at Ocala? I hang out with a lot of pleasure riders mm-hmm. who have taken up riding late in life after their career was well on its way. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So they have a different point of view and they haven't paid attention to things like improving their balance, improving their ability to move smoothly. They haven't looked at that part of their equestrian life. Okay. So they feel uncomfortable when the hor- on when they're on the ground with the horse, if the horse isn't is doing anything Mm -hmm. because they haven't done that groundwork. There's, they have nothing to draw on. You put the horse, if you put the horse in the round pen, you put the horse in the round pen and make it or move it around at a fast pace to quote, wear it out. When you and I both know a horse is not tired. The horse may be winded, 
but he's not tired because as soon as something comes along that genuinely scares him, <laughs> exactly. he's going to move just as fast as they did <laughs> half an hour ago. Um, yes. So I see a lot of that, but I think people, if you don't have someone to help you understand what to do mm-hmm. for groundwork and why you're doing it, mm-hmm. it's just like when you get on the horse. If you were to get on the horse and never take a riding lesson, you'd be kind of clueless and lost and probably get yourself in some bad spots. Yeah. Same thing with groundwork. You need to understand what it is, why you're doing mm-hmm. it and what your goal is. And that's the neat part with Monty's method is it kind of starts there. This We're going to put you on the ground so you can understand how you move to affect how the horses move and you kind of build it up because for generations and generations, um, Americans were taught to ride without that groundwork part. Just get mm-hmm. on the horse. You were taught how to put the tack on and how to groom, mm-hmm. but that was about the extent of it. <laughs> yeah, know? that's true. That's Picking up feet, you know, there, there, big, yes. big, big thing there. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's so much more to it that you, and then you can transfer that to in the saddle because I hear a lot. Well, that's groundwork and I want to ride. But the yeah. two, the two do work together, right? They do. So this is the brilliant thing. It's hard to find. Well, you're a coach, so you're good. It's hard to find people who completely understand this because they they don't know how how you can do groundwork to get in the saddle. First of all, that's an unknown, right? There aren't chapters in the in the training books about. Uh, building up a top line so that when you get in the saddle or using the double line reins from the ground, ground driving, in order to put lefts, rights, and backups on your horse before you're in the saddle. So, I mean, even getting a new horse for you, who's been ridden maybe seven years, whatever, um, it's better if you did some groundwork first and get to know that horse and the horse gets to know your actions too from the ground. But let's even take it one step further and say, how how do we stay in shape around our horses in order to be nimble and to keep our um, flow going even into older age, keep those reflexes. It's it's reflexes, but it's also just a way of moving carefully and slowly and and well. But you have to be muscled to do that, just like with our horses too. The fun thing about um, we're we're gonna get to Mark Bolander here in just a little bit too. But when we discovered his training methods were ground based first, I went ah. Oh, That's so nice because there's very few trainers who promote that a lot, you know, as groundwork before you um, ask them to go over an obstacle. What I see and the magic secret sauce is that people are a little bit uh, worried about getting jumped on while they're trying to learn how to, you know, get across a suspension bridge or something. But if we do the groundwork first, where you establish a bubble around you and the horse knows that, then, OK, now they're more confident with your you're going backward, going forward, taking turns. And then you get close to an obstacle and it goes like, really, you're not going to let me jump in your lap? No, we're not <laughs> going to do that. So we're going to go across the suspension bridge. Oh, but it feels really ooey. Well, we might take it sideways and make it a real quick trip, two steps. And then we're That's done. exactly. It's only going to be two <laughs> That's one speed. You can do this. <laughs> you can do it. And then when they get confident like that, you get confident too. And now you can do it the long way. What? Now you can go the other way, backwards. And so, yeah, no, I don't mean backing up. That's a little bit further along. <laughs> I mean, turn around and go back the other way. But, you know, people are starting to feel like, oh, okay, all right, we made it. We're not dead. Didn't jump on my lap. Now, when you get in the saddle, the horse is already like, I did this 15 minutes ago. It's no big deal. And you're like, hey, I know what I'm doing up here. I don't get stepped on either. Yes. So it, it all just builds on itself. And I know that you understand that too. But I would love for the next generation to really get a hold of that and feel really confident. And I think I think they're reaching out for it. Yeah, I do too. And I, I like that more and more people are appreciating that doing the groundwork is not about because for a while this was the trend groundwork was there to dominate the horse Mm -hmm. groundwork is not to dominate the horse the groundwork is to learn to communicate with the horse build a relationship with the horse so that the horse wants to work with you he goes i like working with you because you tell me i do a great job a lot Mm -hmm. and you never get me in trouble you know so i really like that you know yeah 
I love that too. And, and it, I mean, everybody goes like, oh yeah, I'm building a connection with my horse. Okay. I don't know what that looks like exactly, but I do know that the horse is more confident and you're more confident and they're, you know, looking to you for right. that confidence. Right. So they look can, for you. They mm-hmm. say, where are you at? Yeah. I need you to help me. Cause mm-hmm. I know you do that. We've, we've built past experiences together mm-hmm. that something intimidating came along and you helped me through it. And I felt good about myself when I got done. Yeah. 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 And you know, I'll, I'll, I'll hit some, I'll hit below the belt a little bit on this one too, but we don't use treat training for that. We feel, uh, I, I'll call it a marker training if you want, a little rub between the eyes, uh, just under the forelock right there in that little vulnerable spot where they can't really see what you're going to do with your hand. But That's their they favorite start rubby looking. spot. I know, it is. it is. It's just such a great bar. And for some horses, it's a little bit on the shoulder. It, it doesn't have to be there. But I like to start there because I like to watch their head start to seek you out. Like, was that good? And they, they put their forehead right towards you. Like, and you just like give a little rub. Yep, that was good. I love that. And And you can just, you can see them going, yay me. It's true. (laughs) Uh, So true. Just like your kids. And, and so I think if we can start to do that, then they're not distracted with a treat. And you want to give them a treat in the bucket when you go back to the bar. And I think that's brilliant. I think it's wonderful. Low sugar, maybe, I don't know, but you know, let's all be in shape. So let's us get in shape so that we can be on the ground with our horses. Let's get the horses in shape so that they feel really good about all that tack we put on them and the things we do on them. And um, let's get our brains in shape too about the way we move around a horse. And maybe we'll just, maybe this is the, how we live forever. I don't know. It could just make us live forever. Well, you know, even at quality over quantity, I don't mm-hmm. know if you're going to live longer or not, but you can live better. There you go. Yeah, for sure. For well, speaking sure. of things that, that we love, Mm-hmm. Before we get to Mark's interview, which is lovely and fascinating, stay tuned, folks. We need to hear about hands on gloves. And normally you hear a little hands on gloves commercial right about here. But today I wanted mm-hmm. to mention to you we got a new set of hands on gloves, compliments of the movement. Yes. Yeah. So we whipped them out the other day because the old ones got passed along to gr- doggy grooming. Oh, good. <laughs> so we, we, good. Whipped, we whipped out our, our, hands-on gloves because it's shedding season here mm-hmm. and we have curry combs and we have shedding blades and we have our hands-on gloves nice. and i did a little test okay the hands-on gloves took out way more hair than the other two. Oh, i so believe you and were they comfortable everybody was happy with all that hair coming out and everything oh gosh That's yes good? it's it, yeah. it, it well they're easy because you can use two hands at the same time so you get mm-hmm. You know, you get twice as much grooming in the twice same amount much, of time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when your shedding blade, he didn't take much out, right? Little handful. Mm-hmm. Curry comb, it took a lot out, but every 15 seconds you had to clean it because yeah. it would get full, right? Yeah. It, it took a bunch of hair out, but yet every 15 seconds you got to clean that. The hands on gloves, you could do a half a horse before you had to empty it yeah. out. But hands on gloves, which can be purchased at your local tax store or handsongloves.com. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to have a chat with Mark Bolender, who is going to be coming out to do another clinic on your mountain trail course. So let's That's do it. That's true. Mark Bolander is the nation's leading expert in mountain trail, extreme mountain trail, and competitive trail. He's a three-time national champion and one of the most popular trainers in the country. Today, Mark's unique style of horsemanship has made the Bolander brand synonymous with these disciplines. Mark's unique demonstrations stimulate and entertain his growing audiences. Featured on TV's Best of America by Horseback, Mark has written for numerous national magazines. He authored a popular book called Bolander's Guide to Mastering Mountain and Extreme Trail Riding, his first book written about these sports. Mark's horse, Checkers, was distinguished by becoming the 2020 Briar Horse. Well, welcome back. Mark Bolander, I'm so happy to have you on the show again, and uh, I'm so happy that you're coming back to see us in Solvay. Well, thank you for inviting me. Oh, of course, of course. I would have knocked your door down to bring Lee back too, by the way. So she said she's coming. <laughs> so you got to bring her too. So, uh, well, we're excited to talk to you. You've got a big schedule in 2024. I'm proud of you for getting up out of the couch and, and still going because you've done it all, Mark. We know you've achieved in so many different worlds, and but you're still building buildings. You're still building, you're building a house even right now, right? For someone. <laughs> yeah, and, I'm building a house and oh everything else. 
yeah. Yeah. And so you're just a busy guy, which uh, at this point you don't have to be. You've done it all in the competitive trail world and you've done it all in the workaday world. Um, but you had a daughter who liked horses and that got you into the horse world. And we're fortunate because yes, of it. it yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you want to. Give us a little short story on that, and then we'll jump into horses. But <laughs> Well, my daughter uh, wanted a horse, and I wasn't impressed. I thought horses were beautiful, but I thought they were also rude um, <laughs> and because I didn't understand them. But my daughter wanted a horse, and she ended up with a horse, and she ended up with a barn, <laughs> and it went on and on, and we decided we'd do a family thing. So I bought my first horse because she was beautiful, and she was. Uh, she was an alpha mare, and I learned a lot about horses mm -hmm. from her. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to have unannounced dismount, dismounts or gravity <laughs> checks, whatever you wanted to call them. <laughs> yeah. And that was when I was 39. Right. And then um, the operative I got part, some right? help, and I traveled for seven years with another person around and learned a lot from everyone. And the rest is history. And then I gave up my amateur card and began to uh, train. In 2000, I think it's 2006 or seven, and I've never looked back. And it's uh, it's fascination with the mind of the horse. I find mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to talk about today too, because we did get into the nuts and bolts. Uh, you know, your book, Bolander's Guide to Mastering Mountain and Extreme Trail Riding, is great. It's like the definitive book for for competing even, you know, and all the, the obstacles that you've created are fascinating. Um, torturous for horse on horses, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, all I have to say to, to make people shudder a little bit is squirting water box or swinging bridge, you know, um, but people go like, what? And I say, no, 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 it's really fun. And I tell you the, the arc of the story is we're going to talk about in hand and starting from the ground up. But we're also going to say we end with grown women giggling on their horses at the end of the day. And it's so <laughs> we much. Do. We do, don't we? So anyway, it was fun to have you here and I'm excited to have you back. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about a page on your website that I think is so important and I don't want people to miss it. You have four principles guiding a horse's world. And if you could speak to those a little bit, principle one, I'll read to you is a horse's world. There is a definite pecking order. No two animals are on equal footing. Boy, how true is that? It's, it's something that we all know. We all watch with our own eyes. You can feed all the horses out in the field uh, and horse number three can go eat number four's hay, but mm -hmm. it doesn't dare go eat number <laughs> two's hay two's. or else all heck break loose. So we've all witnessed it. Um, I might not agree with their their world. I find it a little barbaric and rude at times, but I really don't want to create them into a human being because look around us, we're pretty screwed up. <laughs> That's a really good point too. Who are we talking? Yeah, I know. Principle number two is a horse is a natural born follower, but only to a clear and consistent leader. Boy, how true is that? You cannot go out and treat your horse different every hour or every day, you know, have a bad day. So you go take it out in your horse or have a wonderful day and go feed your horse treats and everything like that. The instinct of the horse, its ability to read you is far beyond your ability to read that horse. Mm -hmm. And they're going to see the inconsistency right off. And you're going to run into many issues. Mm -hmm. That horse is going to be walking all over the top of you. It's going to appear rude or it will feel free to bite you or kick you or step on your foot. All kinds of subtle things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. dad teaches this a lot too, in that um, looking at a horse in the eye in horse language between them means go away, right? I mean, they give them the stink eye among that hierarchy <laughs> we're talking about. It means go away. But horses are generous enough to let us do that ugly eye thing, you know, and go like, oh, my horse loves me and looks in my eye. Um, but I think it is counter to their character and that they're just generous about it. What do you think? I think they're very generous. They're probably one of the most forgiving animals I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, God says, forgive a person 70 times seven a day, which is a little bit tough for us humans to stomach. <laughs> but I swear these horses could live by that. Uh, and I tell people, if you truly love a horse, there isn't anything you can do to screw up the horse that can't be undone. 
Um, you know, love covers a multitude of sins. And if you truly mm-hmm. love that horse, everything's going to come out in the end just fine. That's good. I think they read our intent. Yeah, too. So mostly. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. principle three is the horse tries to please those horses they deem superior to them. You know, that's really true because um, horse number two can go eat nor- number three's hay and number three just simply moves away. Mm-hmm. It's a hardwired instinct in the herd. Uh, to try to please those they see above and you, they can't change a hardwired instinct. It is part of them, part of their world. And so that gives us a real advantage. If you're clear and consistent and you are fair and you love that horse, um, they are going to, they're going to give you everything. Yeah. They, they are going to give you their heart for sure. You bet. And they yeah. will try to please you, but that puts a lot of burden upon you yeah. to properly then train them in the obstacles because without mm-hmm. proper training, they say, okay, we'll go ahead and try this balance beam. Uh, but if it isn't trained right, they fall off and then they get leery of your leadership. So you, as a teacher, you have to teach that horse. You don't make it. And that's the big difference. You have to find a way to inspire that horse to learn. It's just like teaching people, and I am a teacher by profession, That's right. it's you have to find out what motivates that person to learn, because you can't make anyone learn that doesn't want to learn. The horse is the same way. You have to find what button motivates that horse to try. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is to be a clear and consistent leader, which also means you've got to um, take the burden of keeping that horse safe. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, dad says it in a, in a sentence uh, that like this, the good trainer can get a horse to do almost anything he wants him to do. The great trainer gets the horse to want to do it. And I think that's, that's right. where you're headed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yep. um, so principle number four and the last one is where I want to go today, which is instinct drives principles one through three. Instinct mm-hmm. is a strong word that um, I've heard you say, we don't know why there are instincts, but they're there. So deal with it. Um, Instinct is a different type of intelligence than God gave us. And it's something scientifically to this day, we can't explain how it works. And I can talk about insects and birds and migrating birds and fish and bears. Mm -hmm. For instance, those little dragonflies you see around the ponds, yeah. They migrate 13,000 miles. Incredible. We don't know how. They have no GPS. They have no little blue dot on their cell phone telling right. them where to go. <laughs> <laughs> and so the instinct is different than what we have. Humans, we only have what we think is one instinct, and that's the fear of falling. You can take a little baby, put them, let them crawl out, and if there's a glass um glass floor or something, they will instinctively draw back. And I think also that we have another one called mother's instinct. Uh, You know, you just cannot deny that. And mother's instinct in the mammal kingdom is extremely, extremely strong. So instinct is very different from their intelligence. And in most of their world runs on instinct not intelligence. For instance, at the water hole, the first sign of danger, the horse doesn't sit there and process, okay, we have a dangerous situation, the cougar is sitting here. No, their their first instinct is they bolt and run without right. thinking. Mm-hmm. And when we train a horse, we're actually trying to flip their mind. The opposite of how they're programmed by nature, we're asking them instead of reacting first and then thinking, we're acting them to think and then react as requested or as they've been taught. And I want to take back a comment that you mentioned about a great trainer will make the horse want to. How totally true. I use the example in a lot of my clinics. In school, there were teachers that we did not want to hear the bell. There were other teachers we could not wait to hear the bell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You think about that, and it's very mm-hmm. true. And so if you're fair, 
to those horses and they have that instinct to please you, mm -hmm. they're going to, they'll go on forever without getting sweaty or stressed or anything else because they have a lot of trust in you. Mm -hmm. They're, they're trusting the leadership to protect them. And that's ironic because in the wild, the alpha mare, which will lead the herd, mm -hmm. the alpha mare will put their life on the line to protect the herd. And I've actually witnessed it myself with our alpha mare chasing a cougar out of the pasture. <laughs> she had no thought about her own safety. Her right. instinct was protect the herd. And that's a hardwired instinct. And it, it's fascinating. But did she think about what she was doing? Probably, Probably not. not. <laughs> Probably not. It's just like, and you know where all the rest of the herd was? Right behind her. Go, let yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> Urging her yeah. on. <laughs> Yeah, encouraging her on. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, Dad even sees that here on the farm in deer. That the it's again, it's the women, um, it's the does who are protecting the yep. herd. Usually, one a matriarch yep. he calls it, and they literally go at the challenger, whether it's a coyote or a cougar, we have them here too, and they pound their feet on the ground. And it's yep. it's pretty unnerving, frankly. And they snort and they do all these things that are super not flight animal looking, you know, pretty aggressive. Right. They're aggressive. Yeah. But they are protecting the herd and the herd has complete deference to those. And they're slipping out the back end, by the way. So I know. <laughs> okay, we're gone. <laughs> Good yeah, luck. She told us your, to go. Your lunch. <laughs> your lunch. <laughs> we're lunch maybe in a week. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But no, that's enough usually to chase those coyotes away. The cougar, you know, that might tangle a little bit, but the the coyotes know that and they uh, mm -hmm. they're like, dang, we we got discovered. They they're more stealth. But anyway, I think horses have that same. I think most flight animals have the same sort of. Um, you know, by biophysics, whatever, you know, they've got flight, they've got heart rate, they've got cortisol, they've got adrenaline, all those things in, in a similar fashion. And their mm -hmm. whole goal is to survive. So, so when we take something like your squirting water box and we say, but please, <laughs> I would really like to walk over that with you. How do we override some of those instincts to say, wait a minute, if I give up my feet, man, I could give up my life. You know, I'll take myself back as a teacher and the horses, most of them, that's not the first obstacle, obviously, you start with. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> and most of the horses, as, as you have witnessed, they're going, going to object to my engineering. They're, they're going <laughs> to think that I'm crazy. But I don't care if that horse is scared. I don't even care what they think. Okay. What I care about is where I can take that horse. Because I know when that horse learns to address its own fears and it, if it trusts you and is looking to please you, that's going to override the fear of the unknown. It doesn't take away all the trauma, but once that horse learns that it can face its own fears, face the dangers and think it through. Okay. You'll see them change at the end, and they are so proud of themselves because hmm. they're a very proud animal, very majestic animal. And so I don't care. You know, discipline at first is not easy. You get in shape for any sport. I used to competitive ski, uh, water ski on the circuit. You know, we had to work. Often we would ski three times a day, early morning, noon, late at night, to keep our body in shape. It wasn't easy. It was painful at times. We would fall and fall and fall. These horses, to build their boldness and confidence and take them where they can go, it's not always easy and it's not always pretty at first. But the outcome, the end, is beautiful. And that is my focus. Not the short term, not the pain, not the uh, little bit of drama and theatrics. And they're watching you as you can't believe. And I've talked to my wife often, who is an integral part of everything that we do and the expos that we go to, such a help in the clinic. Yeah. Yeah. We are doing less and less. I am moving my feet less and less, and my results are quicker and quicker and quicker. It doesn't with matter. Your students, with your students or with, with your horses? Sorry. With uh, both, with yeah. the horses and the students. Okay. And the less you do 
and the horse is watching you. And if you think about it, a ho- in their herd, a horse above doesn't move their feet for a horse below. Mm-hmm. So that horse is watching you and they're monitoring everything you do. So if you're animated and you're starting to move your feet and you have a very busy body, it's very distracting. It mm-hmm. also takes away in that horse's mind that you're in charge because in their world, a horse in charge doesn't do a whole lot, doesn't move mm-hmm. a lot. But okay. when they move, there are consequences if you don't move immediately. It's fascinating to watch. Makes sense. And so the less you do and the more you focus, and in the 70s, they had some amazing studies on self-fulfilling prophecies in visualization. Mm. And they're extremely powerful where we often will become what we think we are or what other people tell us what we are. And if we believe them, we can fall into that trap. No one has a right to tell you what you are going to be. That is up to you, up to you and God. Mm -hmm. In those horses, if you focus on teaching them go across the swinging bridge, for instance, or the balance beam, that's going to take you just minutes. The average time to teach a balance beam uh, is about five minutes. The average time to get a horse over the swinging bridges is under five minutes now. At the Expos, where we were just back at Equine Affair in Massachusetts, uh, all all the horses, we had seven to nine horses per session. Within an hour and a half, all the horses had mastered in a quiet way the balance beam, the teeter-totter, and the swinging bridge. Wow. And that's not bad. That's not bad. That's amazing. And yet, we're doing less and less. And one of the photos that I put up on Facebook that they took back there for, I think, Horse Illustrated, The horse has his head down. I have a loose lead rope Mm -hmm. and the horse is quiet. And the horse had never seen a swinging bridge in his life. Gosh, yeah. Everybody wants that, Mark. Everybody wants their horse to, you know, stay chill. What is the equation about keeping them chill in order to, I mean, now I'm talking about the rider, (laughs) chill. So I know you start us on the ground and you build our confidence in the ground. Yeah. And you said something really clever. I, I heard that you said starting in hand is less contact with the horse too, which it, it divides those nerves. It doesn't run up the lead rope, but it can be felt through the saddle. It can be, they can feel your heart beat in the saddle. Right. And if your legs are tight, your thighs are t- tight, your heart beats up, the horse is already stressed and it feels the stress above <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a downward spiral right. and everything goes south. And that's why I start them in hand because I need to remove the heartbeat from the equation. And yeah. if that person then can see that horse learning to go over the swinging bridge, for instance, and the horse, the person goes, Oh man, okay, I can ride it. If I have a person that says my horse will never do that. Mm-hmm. I say, okay, give me your horse because <laughs> it won't do it. If that is what you're feeling. The other thing that uh, you may find interesting, we never worry about teaching from the right side. Ah, yes. They have almost a split brain because they can't read you out of their right eye. That study came out of the UK shared by CSU about what, eight years ago, the left eye grows stronger over time to read you. Mm -hmm. And so we just worry about the right side or the left side. Because they can watch you, they can monitor you, and they are with you every second. And so if they're reading that this is my expectations, uh, you can do that. And where we touch probably around 3,000 horses a year, one after another, in the summer, it's nonstop. We have about, oh, 2,500 horses go through here a year. And then the clinics around the globe, um, I get very comfortable taking that horse whether it's a 18 plus hand or 14 hand horse, everything in between, it doesn't make any difference. The disposition or the model or the make or breed, it just doesn't. Yeah. They are reading you. That instinct is the same. That's and if you are quiet mm-hmm. and you are focused and you're not taking your eyes off and I'm just focused on this is what you can do. I know you may be scared, but guess what? I don't care because I'm going to take you a place. You're going to be so proud of yourself. Oh, yeah. And it's true. And we take these off the track thoroughbreds that are, you know, supposedly you can't, you can't 
put them in a pasture and then take them into a trail. We do because we're building their confidence all along in hand first. And the le- and the, that near side thing is a really interesting thing too because we do we do train so much from the near side as opposed to the off side or left side versus the right side mm-hmm. um, that it makes sense to habituate to that. And then, you know, later on you want to, you know, when you've got checkers, which is your now retired, beautiful briar horse, but a real horse, yeah. um, <laughs> became a briar in 2022, I think. Was that right? I think so. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. He's, I mean, I'm sure you could use him in hand from the ground on the right side and be fine. Right. Yeah. Actually yeah. what what's interesting, I didn't finish that story. So we took 57 horses that after the, that study came out, we took 57 horses and we said, we'll see if we can put this study into a practical application. So they learned to be saddled, long line driven, ponied, learned all the obstacles in hand, 180s, 360s with their eyes closed. Okay. Uh, we noticed the horses were learning at about twice the rate, but they were showing much less signs of stress, such as less sweat less swishing of the tail, less pinning of the ears, tightness of the eyes, tightness of the muzzle, and a lower heartbeat. And we thought, fascinating, but almost twice the rate. After 30 days, we went to the right side, and it was as if we'd always been there. Ah, that's interesting. So, yeah, Yeah. so it is passing through. You just didn't have to do it. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, what happened, they can't read you out of their right eye. They're learning something new, so they're already stressed. They can't read you, who they Mm -hmm. have learned to trust. So now they're more stressed, and it's just a downward spiral. And so you have to get more aggressive, and this way, it's just you naturally uh, teach them. And and then you build it. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're talking intrinsic versus extrinsic learning and you're absolutely right. Everybody would prefer an intrinsic anytime over an extrinsic Mm -hmm. if possible. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mark, you're amazing. And I'm so glad that at 39, your daughter insisted that she get a horse (laughs) (laughs) and it's fun. It's fun to have your brain working on this stuff because sometimes a mature brain, you know, is trying to figure out horses more than the person who's been raised with horses too. So we learn, we learn a lot from, from you all. And, Oh, you're going to the more the the more you sorry. learn the less you know right I, know. That's exactly <laughs> I, know right. I feel yeah. the same way so we're going to have you here um in 2024 uh october 25 26 and 27 three days of clinics with mark bolander so people will have to look for that when we get that up and going and we're excited. It'll be on the long year of, of expos and everything else, but we hope that you are excited to be here and uh, get a little more time with Monty and, and the deer and our farm. And it was lovely to have you here. We're looking forward. We're really, really excited. Love Sylvain. Love, love your dad and love your farm. It's just yeah. fantastic. We're very fortunate, very blessed. Well, thank you very much for being with us on Horsemanship Radio, and um, I love to, to Lee as well. Monty likes to say that the concepts inherent in the language equus are based upon always giving the horse the power of choice. This is why he created his online university. So rehabbing and rehoming racehorses, you want to save them all. We get it. You will love this series with Monty and Jamie Jennings, host of Horses in the Morning, and a certified Monty Roberts instructor out of Oklahoma. They work together on retraining X racehorses or off-the-track thoroughbreds for new purposeful careers. See this series at MontyRobertsUniversity.com. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, I have an untouched horse and I am in big trouble. My question is, how do I get a halter or head collar on an untouched horse? Help! Monty's answer. 
I love working with these horses. We're currently building a new untouched horse facility as part of our school here on Flags Up Farms in California. We have many courses that deal with the untouched horse as part of a primary part of the lessons offered. A chute, crush, or small enclosure is very helpful when it comes to putting on the first head collar. This structure is made up of planks or metal pipe tubing with spaces between them. These spaces are large enough for an artificial arm to go through so you can stroke the horse while standing outside the chute. There should be steps on the outside so you can stand in a position where you can reach the head and neck over the top of the chute without placing yourself in danger. Once in this small enclosure, we ask the horse to accept a lot of touching and rubbing with our human hands. I also recommend the use of an artificial arm as described later in answers about one-sided horses and horses that are difficult to shoe. I rub them all over this arm, all over their body, under their belly, and down on their legs. Having accomplished these procedures, I then begin to touch the horse's head and neck and introduce him to the halter while he is standing in the chute. There is a logical process to be followed after the first halter has been put on. This is well covered in the DVD, You and Your Wild Horse. It is crucial that one stays in a safe position at all times while working with untouched horses. Ian Vandenberg and Kelly Marks work together as instructors in My Concepts in England. They have devised a clever system that uses a forked stick with a hook on it to put the halter on an untouched horse. It is quite something to see and very effective. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. February, here we are, 16 through 18, we're coming right up on a horse sense and healing. And then on the 24th of February, we have a Horsemanship 101. Those are super popular, and I think they might be full, but check us out on MontyRoberts.com. Then in March, we have on the 31st, an Easter Mountain Trail Play Day. You go like, that's all you have in March? But we have all our advanced courses going on, and you know who you are. <laughs> and then in April, we have April 1 through 16 is the Introductory Course of course, course of Horsemanship. That almost sounded like a poem. <laughs> April a 1 lot. through 16 was Introductory <laughs> Course of Horsemanship. And I didn't even put Monty Roberts in there, but it is. It's our um, two-week course on the way to certification. So, And then we have the intro exams on the 22nd through 26th right after. And then advance notice because we had Mark Bolander on here today. It's the last week in October, October 25 through 27. So we're going to have three separate clinics, 25, 26, 27, because we don't get him here this often. So um, we are very much looking forward to that and um, watch for our, if you're not on our newsletter, go on MontyRoberts.com and sign up for the free Ask Monty because you get to stay up with all the stuff we do. And we have a Q&A on there every every week, which I do on every Sunday night. And uh, it also will tell you about the upcoming clinics and activities that we do here at the California Horse Center on, on Flag is Up Farms on Monty and Pets. So, but Jen will tell you all how to do that. Da, 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 it's all, all can be found, this podcast and more at MontyRoberts.com. It's your one-stop shop for everything Horsemanship Radio, Monty Roberts, California Horse Center, Flag is Up Farms, all of it. And if you want to give them a call, you can do that too. A real human being will answer the phone, 805-688-6288. And if you cannot remember that number, you're one of those people like me that can't remember phone numbers, <laughs> you can go to MontyRoberts.com and the phone number's right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and for details about today's show, as we said, you can go to MontyRoberts.com. Or for just podcast stuff, you go to HorsemanshipRadio.com. And you will find links, photos, and more information about today's guests and topics. Yep. And we'd love that feedback, too. So please follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash Monty Roberts or Twitter at Twitter.com or X.com forward slash Monty underscore Roberts. And Instagram, the pretty one is Instagram.com forward slash Monty underscore Roberts. Many thanks to our sponsors, too. That's handsongloves.com, and it's montyrobertsuniversity.com. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. (laughs) 